Hey, gas gasaholics, how are you doing today? I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. Uh, a morning edition on this wacky Wednesday. It's hump day, middle of the week. You know, wide tire Wednesday, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's an automotive enthusiast day for sure, as is every day in my house. One of the things I wanted to talk about in the website Jalopnik brought up was myths about cars and modifications and upgrades and things like that, and just general information you hear about cars on a daily basis sometimes. Now, one of the things, myths can be harmful. Now, someone may say, oh, that car, all those models burn oil. Mm, all cars burn oil. How much? Yeah, more or less. Depends on your driving habits, too. But that's another story altogether. But let's talk about some of the myths that we encounter on a daily basis. Now, one of the things that we are bombarded with, if you're an enthusiast, is better braking. And I'm all for better braking on a car, and I've improved braking on my cars in many cases, adding disc brakes, changing the brake pads. I even tried the drilled rotor trick. And you know what? They look cool. They don't do anything. Yeah, that's right. Drilled rotors. Yes, some manufacturers put them on their cars. They look cool just like those little yellow strips on the bottom of the splitter on a Dodge Charger. They look cool. They don't do anything, but they look cool. Yeah, those strips are another myth, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Porsche does this, and Mercedes does this, and, well, you can buy drilled rotors just about everywhere, and they profess to give you better braking. They don't. Don't waste the money. If you don't believe me, talk to the people at StopTech and some of the big brake companies and ask them what they think about drilled rotors and so forth to see if it's, well, really true. Now, there's a myth about fuel-injected cars that you need to start them up and you don't need to warm them up. Well, you need to warm up a car, period. The engine, just for a few moments anyway, because... Not only is the engine cold, especially when you live in the East Coast, where, well, in every place where it snows, for example, <coughs> excuse me, the engine is not only cold, but so is the transmission. And the transmission is warmed up through the radiator of your car. Yes, it is. I know it's warmed up from operating, but the cooling lines from a transmission, automatic transmission, that is, go through the same area that the water that's warming your engine or keeping your engine at an even keel or temperature goes through. So it helps warm the transmission fluid. Now, there's nothing you can really do to warm the differential fluid other than driving it. Uh, manual transmissions, the same thing. The engine isn't going to translate heat to it or transfer heat to it. So you've got to be cautious on how you drive until the engine and the car itself warms up. And that doesn't matter whether it's automatic or manual transmission. Automatic is heated and cooled the same way the engine is. The story that Corvair died because of Ralph Dater's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, well, it's professed because it's a popular saying. And people said it all over. But the book was written and published long before the Corvair died. And the problems the Corvair had, although well-documented, were pretty much ended in 1964. The book came out in 1965 and didn't even address that issue. The issue was, and it's the same for Volkswagen Beetles and 356-style Porsches, the swing axle differential. When you go into a turn, if the rear end starts to lift, unload, the tire starts to tuck the car can turn over. Any vehicle with a swing axle rear end can do that. It's not just the Corvair. Volkswagen, Porsche, as I said, and the Corvair had the same basic design transaxle. Oh, and by the way, so did the Pontiac Tempest in 1961, 2, and 3. Did he write about the Tempest? No. Did he write about the Volkswagen? No. Mm, not really. How about the Porsche? Mm -mm. Porsche was considered a very good handling car. In 1964, Corvair added, well, a leaf spring, another leaf. 
that went from side to side to keep the wheels from tucking down. Now, a lot of Volkswagen enthusiasts added a camber compensator, which is basically the same thing, to the Beetles, and I guess it would work on a Porsche as well. I've got one on my Puma. It keeps the wheels from tucking hard in a turn. When you go into a turn hard, the outside edge of the tire tends to dig in. If you haven't got negative camber, you have positive camber to start with, it's going to tuck in. That could create an issue. A handling issue. Was it unique to the Corvair? No. Was it the demise of the Corvair? Oh, hell no. The book came out in 1965, which means, means it was written in 63-64. And the Corvair stayed in production through 1969. What was the death of the Corvair? Hmm. The Camaro. That's right. Now, Chevrolet, when you think about it, had two compact cars. No other General Motors division did. They had the Corvair that was introduced in 1959, and they had the Chevy 2 or the Nova that was introduced in 1962. Two compact vehicles vying for the same market. Different approaches, and the Nova getting a V8 became more popular than the Corvair's turbocharged engine, which put out a lot less horsepower than the V8 and torque. It also had a lot less room than the Nova, and was also not quite as conventional. Was the Corvair a good car? It had its good and it had its bad. Was it a great handling car? In later years, yes, it was. It was a Porsche beater, and a lot of people called it a poor man's Porsche. At Riverside Raceway, when Riverside Raceway existed, the Corvair set some pretty impressive lap times comparable of the 912s and some of the lower level 911s. Don't believe it? Check it out. Read the history. By 1965, the Corvair had a different rear suspension anyway. Didn't do that. It had an articulated rear end with double CB joints or U joints at each end of the drive shafts, or half shafts as they're called. What was the killer of the Corvair? Market demand. The Camaro sold for the same price as a Corvair. The Nova was more popular than the Corvair, and it was in the same market. That's what killed the Corvair. Not Ralph Nader. Now, lifetime fluids. You ever hear that? Oh, you got a lifetime fluid in your car. No, you don't. Fluids tend to wear out with time. And, yes, they may last a little bit longer in today's market with today's oils and such, but the factory fluid? Yeah. Owner's manual may say it lasts longer, and it does last longer, but not long enough that you never have to service or change the fluids in your vehicle. Toyota had unintended acceleration that killed 89 people. Uh, yeah, it's the floor mats, folks. It's not the car. And any car that had sloppy or misfitting floor mats that could get stuck on a gas pedal could create the same issue. Edgar Glenn says he had a 67 Volkswagen Bug up on two wheels many years ago, and it scared the stuffing out of him. Yeah, it will. Good morning, Merrick. How are you doing this morning? But yes, the Volkswagen had the same basic designed rear suspension as an early Corvair, except Corvair used coil springs, whereas the Volkswagen had torsion bars. All right, moving on. Any car can have sudden acceleration if your floor mat shifted and hit the pedal. It's not limited to Toyota. It was not limited to Audi. Matter of fact, Audi won all their cases they didn't lose any cases. And it was found that it was driver error, not car issues, that created the problem. Was that ever publicized as much as the unintended acceleration? No. Didn't make as much headline news. All right. Don't they make them like they used to? No, and for good reason we don't. Think about it for a second. Today's cars are far better than anything we had when we were kids growing up. And I don't care what era you grew up in, unless you're a baby now. Example, let's look at the Shelby GT350. Wow, 307, 308, 310 horsepower, whatever it was back then. 302, or 289 cubic inches. A Mustang, GT350, sought after by millions of people. High dollar, very desirable cars. 
A four-cylinder Mustang today will outhandle it, get far better gas mileage, and has more horsepower than the GT350 did in 1965 and 1966. Don't believe me? Look at the stats. Current Mustang four-cylinder, six-speed, 311 horsepower, 30 miles per gallon. If you can get 10 out of a GT350, you're doing good. And the GT350, although touted as a very good handling car, was very good for the time, right, Jessica? No. The current Mustang will outhandle, will outdrive, be far more comfortable, and it is heavier than the GT350. GT350s weighed in at about 3,3100 pounds. The current Mustang, four-cylinder, weighs in at about 3,7-3,800 pounds. It's heavier. But where is that strength? It's in safety. That's right. The GT350 had no crumple zones. Oh yeah, they had a roll bar as an option, but that didn't stop front-end issues. It didn't stop very many side intrusion issues. The current Mustang, a far better, far safer car. And if you want to look at it even further, today's Camaro versus yesterday's Camaro. Today's Camaro, much more powerful, much safer, better fuel mileage. If you look at every in every measurable item on a vehicle today, it's better than what we had in the past. Now, do cars of the past look better? In many cases, they do. I love my old cars. I'm not trading them in for a new car. No way. Sorry. Ain't going to happen. But are new cars better or are old cars better? Depends on what parameter you're looking at. If you're looking at safety, you're looking at power, you're looking at fuel economy, new cars win hands down. All right. Never inflate your tires to maximum PSI or you'll risk a blowout. Yeah, guys, it's the opposite. If you run your tires too low, you risk a blowout because the tires will overheat. Now, a higher pressure tire is going to ride a little bit firmer. It's also going to give you better traction. When I was autocrossing years ago, one of the things I did to tune the handling of the car was play with tire pressure. The higher the pressure, the stickier the tire got. Now, it didn't get stickier, it just grabbed better. It kept the tread spread enough that it would grab, and it worked. I could get a car to oversteer by lowering the pressure in the rear, raising the pressure in the front. And if I was on a tight road course, I wanted the back end to come out of the corner. But let's go back to some of the complaints and issues that the Ford Bronco had with Firestone 500 tires years ago. The issue was not that the tire was unsafe as much as it was the tire pressures causing it to be unsafe. So, overinflate your tire and have a problem? Yeah. Maybe you risk a blowout if you hit a real big pothole fast at high pressure because the sidewalls won't absorb as much because of the pressures. But the higher pressure will also give you better fuel mileage. So, higher pressure... Creating blowouts? No. Guys, it's the other way around. Low pressure causes the tire to overheat, and that will cause you to have a blowout. Low mileage used cars are good. Well, sometimes. But why is it a used car with low mileage? Why did someone trade it in, or did they trade it in? Now, in some cases, vehicles coming off lease have relatively low mileage, and it's a Decent deal. May still even be under warranty. But what about those cars that got repossessed? And they were beat to death while they were being used because the owner never paid a payment and didn't care. How do you know that? You don't. You won't see that on a car. Cars are detailed and repaired and fixed before they're sold. No one puts a car in a used car lot in the condition it was bought or taken in as trade. They're detailed. They're serviced. They're fixed for things that are wrong. So is a low mileage car necessarily a better deal? They could be. But they may not have. And you don't know the history of the car. So low mileage does not automatically mean 
it's a better vehicle. The rationale for not wearing a seatbelt. Yeah, I've heard all of these stories. I want to be able to get out in case my car catches fire. Really? I want to be thrown clear of the accident because it's safer to be away from the car. Wrong. If you look at statistics, people not wearing seatbelts or people ejected from their vehicles during an accident are more likely to face serious injury, if not death. Look at photos of racing examples uh, prior to the seatbelt usage. And yes, race cars helped develop the use of seatbelts, but there was a time when seatbelts weren't in anything, and you could watch a driver being thrown out of the vehicle. Now, the speeds were a lot lower then, and in some cases, the driver, well, he did all right because there was no safety built into the vehicle itself. No roll bars, no roll cage. So if the car went over, good possibility he'd get crushed. If he was thrown from the vehicle, possibility he might have lived. But again, where was he thrown? Was he thrown back onto the track where the other cars are racing? Was he thrown into a grass area of the field that the track was around? Don't know. But they don't tell you that either. Are you better off buckled up, safe in your vehicle? Yes. And we talked about that just a moment ago with the safety that's built into new cars. There's a reason the safety is built into the car. It's to keep you safe in the car. There are crumple zones. There are areas that are made to crumple and absorb the impact of an accident. Where are you better off? In the car. Buckled in. I've been wearing seatbelts ever since I was able to install my first set, and I found out the hard way. I had a rear-end collision when I was 17 years old. Now, seatbelts weren't the norm back then. Were you back then in the olden days? But I put them in the car after I had that rear-end collision and met my steering wheel. It was not a good meeting. I wasn't hurt very bad, just bruised up a little bit. My passenger hit the windshield. Hi, Jonas. How are you doing today? And what was the first car to have a seatbelt? Volvo was the first production car to make them standard. Now, 1957, Ford had them as an option. Didn't go over real well. Hi, Bruce. How are you doing today? Bruce Rothberg, my cousin from New Jersey, is watching it. So seatbelts, wear them. I've got them in everything. And I'll give you a little anecdotal story. Uh, a number of years ago, when I worked for the Automobile Club of Southern California, I was driving home from a car show in my street rod. Now, my street rod has three-point belts. Yeah, a shoulder belt, three-point belt, like you have in a new car. Automatic retractor, all that good stuff. Well, I got stopped in a sobriety checkpoint at about 11 o'clock at night. Not a problem. I don't drink, so that's, that's not an issue. Well, the police officer looking in the car sees the three-point belts, goes, huh, safety issues, huh? Okay, where's the airbag? I simply told him I don't live with her anymore. Get out of here! And I went through the sobriety checkpoint relatively quickly. I have seat belts. I put them in all our cars. I still have a set to put in Peg's 46 Ford. They're going in. We've got them in our 56. The Puma's got them. It came from the factory with them. My 48 has got them. The 29 Ford has got them. We put seat belts in our cars. You're better off in your car than out of it in an accident. Trust me. And Jonas says, absolutely correct. I know it, sir. I study this stuff, <laughs> but I'm glad you brought it up because a lot of people don't know that. All right. Cars are the best way to get around. You ever driven in Los Angeles traffic? You can watch people with bicycles passing you if they loud them on the freeway. It is a very convenient way to get around. Is it the best way to get around? It depends on where you live and where you're going. Talk to a New Yorker about cars. Many of them don't even own them. And these are some of the people deciding what you're going to do with your car. They use the subways. They have a mass transit system that is very efficient. Do we in Southern California? Well, they're trying. And actually, their program is very trying. Do I use the mass transit system? N no. Does it go where I need to go? N no. Do I drive a car? Yup. So it's best for me you got to look at your individual situation on that. As far as uh, best way to get around being a car, not necessarily. 
Motorcycles are good, too. And I used to do that. Pickups are good in the snow. No. Four-wheel drive, better. Two-wheel drive, oh, hell no. Did you ever get into a pickup truck and drive on snow or rain? You do realize pickup trucks were designed to carry a load in the pickup bed. Same thing with commercial vans. The back end is light. The back end is made to hold weight. The springs in the back are stiffer. They're there to hold weight. Without weight in the back of the pickup truck, the back end will tend to come loose a lot sooner than a car that has a better weight distribution. A pickup truck is probably 60 to 70% front heavy compared to a car that's probably 60% front heavy. And sometimes you can get a perfect 50-50, but that's most likely on sports cars as far as weight distribution. So is a pickup better in the snow? If you got four-wheel drive, it might be better than a two-wheel drive car. But is it better in general? No, not really. All right, so those are some myths that we've uncovered or reviewed. Thanks to the folks at Jalopnik for bringing some of that up. We do appreciate them and what they do. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, a morning edition here on a Wacky Wednesday. Hey, if you like gas, please subscribe to the YouTube channel for gas. You can see all the back past gas issues. It's also on Anchor FM if you want to listen to it while you drive, but you can't watch it. I mean, sometimes watching me isn't the best thing to do anyway, but you can listen. Anchor FM, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts today. I'm Hot Rod Bob. Gas, the great American auto scene, brought to you by Service Tech Equipment. For all the equipment you need for the shop you've got, whether it's your home shop or your commercial shop, Service Tech can handle it all. I've got their lifts in my garage. I recommend them. Challenger Lifts, Service Tech. they got a great battery pulse charger, too. Check it out. Mention gas when you talk to them. Talk to Craig Heidenthal when you do. Service Tech in Simi Valley, California. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You have a great day. And remember, you've got gas.